Okay, let's talk a little bit about the reasons why belts can miss cup. There's basically four, as I said, and we'll talk about a fifth reason as well. But one of the reasons a belt will cup is because of heat. Now, I'm not talking about heat from a hot, sunny, warm day. I'm talking about heat from hot material. Most conveyor belts are going to resist material that is under 200 degrees Fahrenheit. If material is above that, then it's really important to seek out heat resistant belting. Now, heat resistant belting will prevent that belt from cupping. It'll also prevent some surface damage that also comes about with putting hot material on the belt. Now that surface damage to a belt that has hot material on it typically will come before the belt will cup. And the surface damage that you have in the top cover is gonna affect the ability to clean the belt or to scrape the belt properly to reduce carryback. However, over time, that belt will also be much more difficult to track properly because that heat will contract that rubber top cover, causing that belt to curl or to cup. So heat's one of the reasons why a belt can cup. Another is chemicals. Um, chemicals can extract polymers from the top cover of the belt. It can also add polymers to the top cover of the belt. When a chemical were to extract chemicals from the top cover or from the rubber, that rubber will shrink as it contracts. The problem with that is that the top cover is shrinking, but the bottom cover is not shrinking. So those top covers and those bottom covers can tolerate a bit of contraction or expansion, but it's when that contraction and expansion between those two top cover and bottom covers, when that contraction and expansion is not equal, one is greater than the other, then that's going to cause that belt to curl or to cup. Uh, another is severe trough angle. Let me give you a little bit more about how a severe trough angle can cause the belt to cup. Severe trough angles are determined by the troughability of the conveyor belt. Every belt that's uh, manufactured for US or Canadian markets will typically be designed to trough to 20 degrees, 35 degrees, and or 45 degrees. Those are the three standard trough angles that are used in the US and Canada. So most belts are designed to trough at 35 degrees because that's the most common. Most of you are seeing or operating or working with conveyors that trough to 35 degrees. Therefore, your belts are designed to trough to 35 degrees. However, belts that are manufactured or used in markets other than the US are sometimes designed for different trough angles. The troughing angles outside of the US and Canada are 20, 25, 30, 35, 40, and 45. So what could happen by pushing your belt into this severe trough angle, if you're sourcing a belt that isn't designed to trough at 35 degrees, let's say you're sourcing a belt that's designed to trough at 30 degrees, and you put that belt or force that belt into your 35 degree idlers, you've just exceeded that belt's troughability, and that eventually will cause that belt to cup. So that's how severe trough angle can cause a belt to cup. Number four is what we call over-tensioning the belt. Um, over-tensioning a belt unfortunately can be very common. And when a belt is operated with too much tension on it, over time, it can cause the belt to cup. Um, it, it's not uncommon to see belts be over-tensioned. One of the problems that we often see is that belts that are in a load, load zone, um, in the loading area of a conveyor belt, 
as that belt's being loaded, material, it's not uncommon for material to spill at that load zone. And that material can often spill because of the sag that the belt might have in between the supporting idlers in that skirted area, very similar to the photograph that you see on the left. So the problem with belt sag shown in that diagram on the right is that it, it allows the belt to have a gap between the skirting. What a lot of facilities do when they see that gap or they see dust or spillage coming out from that gap is, well, one, they'll push that skirting down and that can cause some problems. The other thing that they can sometimes do is put more stretch on the belt to try to eliminate that sag. A better solution than putting that stretch on the belt is to increase idlers in that skirted area and support the belt properly. It's not uncommon for facilities to see that sag and then put stretch on the belt and that can be problematic. I wanna run this video for you real quick here and just show you an example of a belt that is pretty extremely over-tensioned and how you can kind of see from that how that over-tensioning of that belt is affecting its ability to track. So watch this video for me. So when I roll that video, you can clearly see that that belt has too much tension on it. One of the best indicators that you've got too much stretch on a conveyor belt is that it elevates out of those carrying idlers when it's unloaded, just like you see in that video. That's a belt that's got too much stretch on it. Now, the problem with too much stretch or the problem with that belt elevating out of those return or those carrying idlers is that there's no contact between the belt and the, the idler. Those idlers need to be square, they need to be aligned, and that's what causes the belt to track properly. If the belt's not sitting in that trough, then those troughs, those, those idlers, don't have any influence on the belt, and that's gonna cause it to be affected by other forces, which will cause it to mistrack. All right, let's talk about that fifth thing. And I said, this is a little up for debate. One of the things that we talk about in that um, foundations book is the acceptable aspect ratios. And in that book, it says that um, the differences between the top cover and the bottom cover, which is what we, how we define aspect ratio, should not be too extreme. It basically states that the, the wider the belt, the greater the aspect ratio could be. Belts that are 36 inches or less should not exceed a one and a half parts of top cover to one part of bottom cover. Belts that are kind of in that mid range shouldn't exceed a two to one aspect ratio. And very wide belts, 54 and above, should stay within a three parts of top cover per one part of bottom cover. But if you look at this photo, and you look at the belts that you have at your facilities, it's not uncommon to see a four parts per top cover to one part of bottom cover, which is what you're seeing in this photograph. Now here's where the debate and the, the difference of opinions come in on this. Belting manufacturers have radically changed how the carcass is designed. It used to be that carcasses were made of man-made, I'm sorry, of uh, natural materials, most often cotton. Now they're using, in some cases, uh, Kevlar, polypropylene, nylon, polyester. Those man-made materials and the way they weave those man-made materials together make for a much stronger carcass than we saw in conveyor belts 20 or 30 years ago. And the stronger that carcass is, the more it has the ability 
to resist the shrinkage that comes over time with that thicker top cover. So as that top cover is incredibly thick and the bottom cover is not as thick, that rubber can contract with time. And because there's not much bottom cover to contract along with it or equal to it, you've got extreme differences between how much the top cover contracts and the bottom cover contracts. However, newer carcasses will fight against that belt's likelihood to mistrack. 